Okay, so in this lab, you are going to be making models of molecules. You're going to be using uh, this worksheet. Let's see, right here it says molecular geometry with polarity and model kits. And you're going to be just going through, now make sure that you start with by drawing the Lewis structure, and then after that you can make your 3D model and sketch it. I want you to sketch it carefully um, because I want you to really depict the geometry of the molecule. And then you're going to name the geometry. I've given you an example there at the top of the worksheet with uh, CH4. It's a tetrahedron or tetrahedral geometry. Then I want you to tell me, are the bonds polar? And remember, our criteria for that is simply if, if the two atoms that are bonded together are different, then we're going to say the bond is polar. And then is the molecule polar? That's where it gets a little tricky, right? And it has to do with symmetry, whether the molecule will orient itself in a magnetic field, or whether the molecule has two different sides. And then finally, what intermolecular forces are present? So <clears throat> what I want you to do is work on the first one. And so stop the video at this point and make um, carbon dichlorodibromine. Stop the video at this point, make that, go all the way through, do the IMFs and everything for that one, and then start the video again, and I'll give you the solutions to that one. Okay, so you've started the video again, and hopefully that means that you have successfully made carbon dichlorodibromine, dibromide, sorry, and this is what it should look like. So it's a tetrahedron. And you might think that it is, it is non-polar because it's a tetrahedron. But remember, these bonds are all polar, of course. So all the bonds are polar. And the molecule is actually polar because it's got two different sides. So on one side is the bromines, and the other side is the chlorines. And because chlorine is a little bit more electronegative, this side is going to have a little bit more of a partial negative charge than this side. And so this molecule will be slightly polar by our definition. <clears throat> now, again, remember if, we, if you're using the rules of symmetry here, a molecule can't be polar if it has more than one rotation axis. Well, this molecule actually doesn't have any rotation axes. Okay. Um, and if you think about whether it would orient itself in an electric field, it would probably turn with the more negative side toward the positive plate. So if my hand were positively charged, it would turn like this. So that's polar. Okay, go ahead and stop the video and build NI3 and then uh, complete the worksheet for NI3 and start it back up again. All right, so you've built NI3 and it should look something like this. It's got nice rotational symmetry around this axis, but that's the only rotational rotation axis that it has. And it's got some mirror planes, but they all include the principal rotation axis. So this could be polar according to those symmetry criteria. And if you look at it carefully like this, you'll see that because the nitrogen is not in the same plane with the iodines, that makes this a partially negative side of the molecule and this partially positive. So this is polar. It would orient itself in electric field so that the nitrogen faced a positively charged plate. Do you see that? And I didn't mention the IMFs on the last one, but because these molecules are polar, that means we'll have dipole-to-dipole -dipole interactions as well as dispersion forces in these materials. So go ahead and stop the video, do phosgene, and then come back. So apparently you've made phosgene, and it should look like this. You've got a double-bonded oxygen sticking up off the carbon, and you've got the two chlorines. Now, there might have been other ways to build this. For example, um, chlorine, carbon, oxygen, chlorine. But that would not have fit our rules of thumb, which are that in general we have a central atom surrounded by other atoms when possible. We're looking for symmetry when possible. We're also looking to have carbon, to put carbon on, uh, four bonds on a carbon as well, and two bonds on an oxygen in general. So that's a good rule of thumb. And uh, this thing is going to have a triangular planar shape. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's going to be polar, right? Because the oxygen sticking up off of here is more electronegative than the others. So this will be the negative end of the molecule. <clears throat> and if you look at it, it has a rotation axis here, but that's it. <clears throat> There's no rotation axis here. 
I have to turn it 360 degrees to get the same thing again. All right, I forgot to mention the, the geometry of the last one, NI3. This was a triangular pyramid or triangular pyramidal. All right, go ahead and stop the video and move on to the next one, which is SO3. <clears throat> Welcome back. You've made SO3, and it should look just like phosgene. So here's phosgene, here's SO3. They should look the same with a critical difference, and that is that instead of all oxygens around, I mean, uh, phosgene had two chlorines, and that makes all the difference when it comes to polarity. They have the same exact geometry. They're both triangular or trigonal planar, right? Trigonal planar. But this one is going to be nonpolar. Now don't be tricked by this double spring here making it look like it's got a different part of the molecule here that's different from the others because that double bond is actually shared among all three positions equally. One way of looking at it is that it is resonating or flipping back and forth between all three. But in reality, it's actually in all three places at the same time, those two electrons. They're, they're, the orbital extends over the whole molecule, the orbital that that double bond is in. Okay, So that is SO3, and it is nonpolar, and so it would only have dispersion forces. Go ahead and stop the video and move on to the next molecule. <coughs> okay, welcome back. We're going to look at SIS2, which I made just like CO2 because that's what its geometry would be like. And I didn't use the sulfur atom because this one has the holes drilled funny. This one has holes drilled at every 90 degrees, which I didn't want. So this thing is SIS2. It is linear with two double bonds. If you're not getting the bonds right on these, the double and single bonds, then go back and check your Lewis structures. This thing is linear and it is nonpolar. Sure, the bonds are pretty polar. You've got oxygen, you've got the, the sulfurs pulling from the carbons, and <clears throat> you've got polar bonds. I'm sorry, this is silicon and sulfur. You have polar bonds, but they're both pulling in opposite directions, so that, that kind of pull cancels itself out. Another way of looking at it, if your partial negative charge is on the sulfurs, then that is that means this thing has equal partial negative charges on both ends and the partial positive charge in the center. So it doesn't have a positive side and a negative side. Think about this in an electric field. If this is a positive plate, which end would turn toward this? Right? Either. That means there's no preferred orientation in an electric field. And let's see, I have a... Let's see if my symmetry would work for me here. It's got a rotation axis here. Um, I guess you could say it has a rotation axis along this too, so that's why it would uh, not be polar. All right, go ahead and stop the video and turn it back on when you've made carbon monoxide. Okay, welcome back, carbon monoxide. And I'm not. I'm realizing I'm not covering all the bases here. I'm going a little too fast. Going back to uh, silicon disulfide. Silicon disulfide is uh, nonpolar course, and so only dispersion forces would be active between those molecules. Looking at carbon monoxide, though, this guy is polar, right? Oxygen, carbon, two obviously different sides of the molecule, partial negative charge, partial positive charge. This would orient itself in a field, so we would have dipole-to-dipole -dipole interactions in addition to dispersion forces for our intermolecular forces. Go ahead and stop, make PF5, turn it back on. And there's PF5, and this is a triangular bipyramid. It has 120 degrees between each of these bonds, and then it has 90 degrees between these bonds. So that's called a triangular bipyramid. Look at the symmetry on that thing. Talk about rotational axes here. Obviously, this thing is not polar according to the symmetry criteria, so we'd only have dispersion forces between these phosphorus pentafluoride <clears throat> Go ahead and stop the video now. Turn it back on when you're ready. Okay, welcome back. This is what your methanol molecule should look like. It's got a carbon in a tetrahedral arrangement with these four bonds, and then it's got an oxygen in a bent geometry. So that's what I'm going to write for the geometry. I'm going to write tetrahedral and bent. Tetrahedral around the carbon, bent around the oxygen. I'm going to say this is definitely polar. This side is definitely different than the carbon side. And 
it's got hydrogen bonding because it has an oxygen bonded to the hydrogen right there. So it's got the potential to, to uh, take part in hydrogen bonding. That's methanol. That's the smallest and lightest alcohol. All right, let, let's uh, stop the video and then turn it back on when you're ready. <clears throat> okay, welcome back. We're, we're getting into some more interesting ones now. Acetone, which is the active ingredient in lots of fingernail polish removers, is going to look like this. Now, first of all, you want to notice here that um, there might have been other ways to build this. So, for example, I've seen a lot of students, instead of bonding these two carbons together, they'll go carbon, oxygen, carbon. Well, that makes sense even from the condensed structural formula that I've given you. I showed you that the, the oxygen was between the two carbons. But if you do it like that, what will happen is you'll only have three bonds on the carbon and you'll have three bonds on the oxygen. And that doesn't follow our rules of thumb. We usually want four bonds, bonds on the carbon if possible. Of course, that didn't happen in carbon monoxide. We only had, we had three on each. But if possible, we want four bonds on the carbon and two on the oxygen. And so this, is, this gives us that shape, though that situation. Now this double bonded oxygen sticking up all alone is called a ketone group, and that's why this is called acetone, all right? And um, this thing is, has got a fair amount of, of symmetry, it appears, but really it's only got one rotational axis, okay? And it has a mirror plane that includes the rotational axis. So the symmetry elements um, indicate that it might be polar. But I think if you look at this thing, you can see that very clearly it has two different sides. We've got this oxygen kind of point here, and then we've got the side with the carbons and the hydrogens on it. So we're going to say this is polar. Now, we're not going to say hydrogen bonding for this. However, if a molecule that had a hydrogen on it came along, these two could hydrogen bond together because this hydrogen, which is being stripped of its electrons uh, most of the time by this oxygen it's bonded to, can get in really close to the, to the electron cloud of this oxygen and they can hydrogen bond together. So we would expect, for example, that acetone and methanol could dissolve very well in each other and could mix very well with each other because like dissolves like. That's one of the principles that comes out of these intermolecular forces that we're discussing. Go ahead and stop the video, turn it back on when you're ready. <clears throat> okay, the next one is called an alkane. It is a straight chain of carbons, and I say straight because it's just a chain, but it's not really straight, is it? It's a zigzag is what you get. Turn it so that it's kind of like this, like a caterpillar. It's just six carbons with hydrogens coming off. What would I call that geometry? Tetrahedral, 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 tetrahedral. I've had people call it linear because it does look like a line, but we'll just say tetrahedral around all the carbons. By the way, what's this one? Well, this one was tetrahedral around the two outside carbons, but it was triangular planar around the central carbon. Is this one polar? No, no way. This one is nonpolar, and dispersion forces are going to be the only intermolecular forces operating in liquid hexane, which, by the way, is a, one of the big components in gasoline. <coughs> Go ahead and stop the video. Turn it back on when you're ready. Okay, and we're back with acetylene. This has two carbons triple bonded together with hydrogens off the sides. Linear geometry, nonpolar. Both ends have a partial positive charge, partial negative charge in the middle. That is nonpolar <clears throat> and primarily dispersing, dispersion forces operating in acetylene gas. Acetylene gas used in welding, used in torches. Burns very hot with oxygen. Go ahead and stop the video, turn it back on, and we will look at diethyl ether. Okay, welcome back. Uh, for the diethyl ether, I've got, a, I've got to um, cannibalize some of my previous models here. So I need two ethyl groups, which is two carbons bonded together. And then this one is sort of like... It's, it's sort of like acetone, except instead of that oxygen being sticking up off the middle, you just put it off the middle carbon. You put it between two carbons and then make it this sort of a shape like this. <clears throat> OK, 
okay? Now, this one is a tricky one in terms of polarity, but first, geometry is tetrahedral, 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 and bent around this. Or you might say 104.5 and 109.5 everywhere else for the angles. How about the polarity, what do you think? Mm, there's not going to be much polarity there, is there? Um, that oxygen is pretty well in the center of the molecule. You might get a slight polarity because the oxygen is, is not in the same line with all the carbons. So you might get a slight polarity from that, but this may be very, very slightly polar. Okay, so that is diethyl ether. <clears throat> Go ahead and stop the video, and we'll make the final compound when you come back. Okay, welcome back. Let's make a benzene ring. Now, I gave you the hint here that is a ring-shaped molecule, but if you do the Lewis structure, you will notice that you have, you're going to have to use double bonds. You don't have enough hydrogens to help you fill all the, the carbons, octets, so you're going to have a double bond alternating with a single bond. So basically, it's going to go uh, double, single, double, single as you go around the molecule, and there's going to be one hydrogen sticking off of each carbon. So you're going to have six carbons in a ring, and they're going to go double, single, double, single, with one hydrogen sticking off of each. <clears throat> and let's see here. All right, look at that thing. So this is benzene. This is a benzene ring. Very famous uh, kind of story. The guy who, in, who discovered um, the shape of the benzene ring or the, the structure of the benzene ring, he'd been puzzling over it for a long time. And then he had a dream about a snake swallowing its own tail. And uh, when he woke up from that dream, he had figured out the structure of the benzene molecule. But this is, what, what's happening here is these double bonds are actually shared among all the positions. Now what kind of symmetry does this have? It has a lot of rotational symmetry around the central axis here, but also every one of these is a rotational axis. So this is definitely nonpolar, only dispersion forces functioning in benzene, okay, which is another uh, organic uh, liquid that's present in gasoline. All right, congratulations. So good job in making all these, these uh, models, and hopefully you learned something about the geometries and figuring out polarity and are able to apply that and predict intermolecular forces. See you next week.